Hey Star Wars fans, Happy Trooper here with another fun project. In this episode, we'll 3D print, paint, and sew to make our very own child from the Mandalorian TV series. The following tools and materials will be used to complete this project. A 3D printer, filament of your choice, abrasives from 100 to 400 grit, including a small file, plastic bonding adhesives, various fillers, auto filler primer spray, green apple spray paint, flat clear spray, orange and light tan enamel, brown and black acrylic paints, an airbrush, various M3 screws and nuts, a pair of glass cabochons are optional, as is the nail polish used to paint the eyes, a sewing machine and thread, duck cloth, faux sherpa fabric, and fabric dyes, and last, a rotary tool is optional but helpful. Feel free to change any of the tools, methods, and materials. No 3D printer? Ask a friend to print the parts for you. No area to use spray paint or an airbrush? A brush and non-toxic acrylic paints can be used in place of enamels. Don't want to mess with fabric dyeing? Check fabric stores for pre-dyed fabric. A list of the materials can be found in the description below. Thanks to Project 842, STL files for the child are available for free and can be found in the description below. If you are going to tackle this project and use the files, please consider making a toy donation to a charity of your choice. Furthermore, please post a photo of your donation to social media with the hashtag ToyDrive842. All of the pieces were printed on a CR-10S using PLA plus filament at a 0.2mm layer height. In an attempt to save a little time and filament, I split the lower torso piece using mesh mixer. I also split the head piece from ear to ear to give me more clearance to work on the eyes. These two changes are not required. Feel free to print the figure as is. Before getting too deep into the project, it's a good idea to test fit all of the pieces. I had a minor issue with the legs attaching to the lower torso. The issue was with the clearance when sliding the leg peg through the torso peg hole. I had to shave out some plastic from the lower torso so that the legs could slide in. In addition, a little bit of filing was necessary for the legs to fit into the lower torso and the shoulders to fit into the upper torso. The lower torso pieces that I split with mesh mixer were initially bonded with SCI Grip 16. This adhesive is excellent for bonding PLA pieces. After about one hour, I used JB Weld Plastic Bonder Epoxy to fill the remaining gap and ensure a very strong bond between the two pieces. Try not to leave excess epoxy on the object, as epoxy can be difficult to sand. I repeated the same process to secure the top torso to the lower torso. The initial bond was provided by SCI Grip 16, followed by JB Weld Plastic Bonder. After all of the pieces have been printed, sand all of the ridges down with 120 grit sandpaper. To ensure that all of the gaps are filled, I applied a mixture of wood filler putty with a small amount of water. I mixed it to the consistency of toothpaste. Using a chip brush, I applied the mixture on the objects. Applying the mixture too thick will increase your time spent sanding in the next step. I left the mixture to dry overnight and then sanded off the rough top layer with 120 grit. Once I began to see hints of plastic, I switched to 220 grit. If you still see any small areas that require filler, use some Bondo Glaze and Spot Putty and sand down with 220 grit. Once you are happy with the filler, sand all of the pieces with 400 grit sandpaper. Project 842 provides two 50mm 3D printed spheres that can be used as eyes. For a more realistic effect, I chose to go with 50mm glass cabochons. Fellow YouTuber Yvonne Williams has a fantastic tutorial on creating creature eyes using cabochons and nail polish. I used her method to create the child's eyes. I put the glass in place and secured with tape. 
I used a dry erase marker to mark the position of the eye holes. I measured the distance between the top and bottom eyelids to be about 24 millimeters. I subtracted 4 millimeters from that measurement and used 20 millimeters as my diameter for the pupils. Using a circle template, I used a hobby knife to make a pupil stencil out of some painter's tape. The stencil was placed on the back of the glass and aligned with the dry erase markings on the front of the eye. One coat of black nail polish was applied. After a few minutes, a second coat was applied, followed by a third. Black spray paint can also be used. After the pupils dried, the stencil was removed and three coats of shimmer brown nail polish were used to color the irises. Allow a few minutes of drying time in between coats. I usually apply filler primer after assembly. In this instance, due to hard to reach areas and delicate connections, I chose to apply a layer of filler primer to the head pieces prior to assembly. This layer of primer will help identify any areas that still require filler. Once the head is assembled, it is more difficult to reach areas such as the inner ears and face. In a well-ventilated area, apply a light layer of filler primer. There's no need to apply it thick on the first coat. If it is too thick, the primer will take a long time to dry. Wait about 5 minutes, and then apply a second light coat. Wait another 5 minutes, and then apply a third coat. After a few hours, the objects can be wet sanded. Soak some 400 grit sandpaper in water. Use a spray bottle to apply water to the 3D printed objects. In a back and forth motion, sand the objects until you feel a nice slick surface. If you still see 3D print ridges, repeat the filler and sanding process without skipping any grits, and then hit it with some more primer followed by wet sanding. The glass eyes are rather heavy, and the head will soon be sealed, so it is important to secure the kabuchans. I used E6000 adhesive for the initial connections. Once the E6000 had set, I cut up a few small pieces of 1mm plastic sign and used a heat gun to mold them into clips that would help secure the glass eyes. I used E6000 on each of the clips and used three clips for each eye. I let the E6000 cure for 24 hours. To join the front and rear head pieces, I used SCI grip number 16. To further secure the head pieces, I used JB Weld Plastic Bonder Epoxy to fill in the gap. I want these two pieces to have a solid bond, so I double bagged it. As previously mentioned, epoxy is difficult to sand, so I applied it carefully, just enough to fill any gaps. If you still have a ridge in the middle of the head, use your choice of filler. I was anxious to keep moving on the project, so I used some quick curing Bondo filler. Wood filler putty can also be used but a longer dry time is needed. 
Now is a good time to mask off the eyes with some painter's tape. Sand off the filler with 220 and 400 grit sandpaper. It's okay if the primer comes off. Next we'll secure the ears. Sand the connection points on the head and ears with some 120 grit sandpaper. Apply plastic bonder epoxy to the connection points and also around the ears to fill the gap. Use a painter's knife or other tool to remove excess epoxy. The epoxy will provide a secure bond and fill the gap between the ear and head. I used an old box and cut a hole large enough to rest the head flat. This provided the position necessary to mount the remaining ear onto the head using the previous steps with plastic bonder epoxy. Sand any excess epoxy off with 120, 220, and 400 grit sandpaper. Use additional filler if necessary and finish off with the appropriate sanding grits. We've already applied some filler primer to the head pieces. We'll repeat the process with the assembled head and remaining body items. The filler primer will help fill any remaining small crevices and give our color layer better adhesion. Again, in a well-ventilated area, apply a light layer of primer. Wait about 5 minutes and then apply a second coat. Wait another 5 minutes and then apply a third coat. After a few hours have passed, wet sand the pieces with 400 grit sandpaper. If you still see ridges, fill them with putty, sand, and reprime. I ended up going through this exercise two times. For the child's skin tone, I will be using Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch in Satin Candy Apple. Clean off any debris with compressed air and a tack cloth. Apply a light first coat of color. Aim to cover about 80% of the object. Wait about 10 minutes and then apply a second light coat of color. After another 10 minutes, apply a third and slightly heavier coat of color. Let the pieces dry for at least 48 hours. Using an airbrush, I applied Tester's enamel in light tan, thin to the consistency of milk, sprayed at about 15 psi. This coat was applied to the ears. Tester's enamel in orange was applied to the inner ears. Light gray enamel was applied to the eyelids, cheeks, and mouth. To give the ridges on the head and face some depth, you can mist on a slightly darker green enamel. We are now done with the enamel paints. Let's seal it with a clear coat. Usually I try to stick with the same brands of paint. For this project, I ended up using Rust-Oleum for my primer and color coats, followed by a Krylon flat clear coat. I tested some Rust-Oleum matte clear on top of the green apple, and the coat still remained satin. Krylon dulled the finish down to a nice flat coat. To finish up the paints, acrylic will be applied to the nails. It was difficult to determine what color the child's nails are in the TV series. In some scenes they looked yellow, in others they looked brown. I mixed yellow and brown together for the nail color. To give the nails a little more presence, I outlined the cuticles with a brown acrylic paint. Finally, to protect this layer of paint and give the nails some shine, future acrylic floor gloss was applied. Any acrylic gloss will do. Black acrylic paint can be used on the mouth, or if your hands aren't steady, you can mix some watercolor, water, and a dash of dish soap to paint the recess of the mouth, and then wipe off the excess with a damp cloth.
Project 842 has provided text assembly instructions with the STL files. Six M3 screws of various lengths are required to secure the arm pieces. Prior to assembly, I had to enlarge the hole slightly with a drill bit. The connection shown here should not be drilled out. I used thread locker to secure the nuts to the M3 screws. They can still be removed, but they won't fall out as easily. The instructions call for lock nuts. I secured the neck peg with E6000 adhesive. I used two different kinds of fabric for the child's robe. I purchased two yards of canvas duck cloth and a half a yard of faux sherpa. Both fabrics were too light and required dyeing. The duck cloth is made of natural material, so I was able to use RIT all-purpose dye. RIT's website has a formula page for creating different colors. I chose a color called pumice stone, which is a mixture of taupe and charcoal gray. I used the washing machine method to dye the duck cloth. I used a half a cup of taupe and two tablespoons of charcoal gray. Please note, this method also requires one cup of salt. I followed the instructions on the website and had a nice warm tan gray material for the outer robe. Please use caution when dyeing this fabric. Canvas duck cloth is prized among Tuscan raiders. Hey, get out of there. After washing, I threw it in the dryer to get any shrinking done before I sew. The Sherpa material is synthetic and required Ritz dye more for synthetics. Synthetics require the stovetop method for dyeing. I used a cheap 4 or 5 gallon pot from Walmart for this project. I followed the stovetop instructions on Ritz website and boiled about 3 gallons of water. I added 1 tablespoon of chocolate brown and 1 tablespoon of frost gray. I put the fabric in and let it set for about 30 minutes, mixing it occasionally. I rinsed out the dye and let the fabric air dry. Before proceeding, I must warn you that I am not a sewing expert. I sewed a robe, it isn't pretty, but it's functional for a toy. Please feel free to improve on the design and sewing procedures. I used the same type of pattern as a Jawa robe and scaled it down to fit this character. Using the measurements from the template, I cut two pieces of the dyed duck cloth fabric. One will be the robe front, the other will be the back. With the robe pieces inside out, I sewed the top of the arms and left the neck open. The robe on the TV series appears to have an upper arm seam inside, while the lower arm seam and robe edges have a frayed outside seam. 
With the outside of the fabric facing out, I sewed the lower arms and sides of the robe. You can fray the edges with a wire brush and by rewashing and tumbling the robe in a dryer with other towels. On the front of the robe, I cut the opening from top to bottom. I then sewed a Velcro strip as shown. The child's robe does have a placket on the front. Here's where things got ugly. I cut another strip from the duck cloth using the dimensions from the template. I sewed Velcro onto one of the edges of the fabric. Using the measurements from the template, I folded the fabric into a placket, ironed it so it would stay in place, and then sewed a stitch to secure the left side. This also added a second stitch into the Velcro on the back. Because I was going through so many layers of material, I used a denim needle on my sewing machine. Next I placed the placket on top of the robe opening and sewed another stitch as shown. The Sherpa cuffs were folded over one inch and stitched. The ends were also stitched. The cuffs will simply be inserted into the sleeves. The next scarf was folded over by two inches and stitched. It will be wrapped around the neck and placed inside the robe.